The JCC infiltration arc has concluded with tragic consequences. 12 teachers dead, student Akira missing. Finally, Sakamoto and Shin accomplished their goal of getting information about X, also known as Kei Yuzuki who shared an orphanage background with Gaku, Yuda, and four others. This revelation raises a chilling question. Could Yuzuki have developed a second personality due to childhood trauma? In this video, we'll delve into the past to uncover the truth behind Yuzuki's mysterious background and its connection to recent events. Let's find out. On another day, Shin and Sakamoto returned home. Shin was happy to be back in their town, feeling like they had been away for a long time. Sakamoto agreed, noting that a lot had happened. He recalled Satoda's death, his fight with Kanaguri, and Akira's decision to go to X. Meanwhile, Shin became concerned when he saw someone shooting at something nearby and asked what he was doing. It turned out to be Amine, who was puzzled by the question, explaining that he had only shot at the vending machine. He asked if it was broken because he was hitting the mark, but no tickets were coming out. Shin replied that Amine had broken it, explaining that this was different from the messed up meal ticket machine at JCC that they needed to shoot. Shin couldn't believe what Amine had done, while Sakamoto explained that Amine had grown up in JCC, so it was unavoidable that he would view vending machines this way. Sakamoto told Amine that in regular society, it's important for them to fit in and hide their identities as assassins. Amine responded not to worry because he got straight A's in his regular society class, which Shin found hard to believe. Shin was then shocked when Amine suddenly jumped over the north gate of the train station, saying they needed to hurry and buy a ticket to catch the train. Shin shouted, explaining that they needed to buy a ticket before passing through the ticket gates. Flashback to one day earlier, while they were still at JCC. Biyoto asked Sakamoto what they planned to do now. Shin replied that they now had information about X's hideout from Club Jam. They knew that X and his group were in an abandoned warehouse in Bangkok, Thailand. Sakamoto added that they would go there immediately after taking care of necessary arrangements. Besides, Akira might already be on her way there, so they needed to stop her before she reached X. Meanwhile, Amine pleaded to go with them. Shin and Sakamoto were puzzled about why he wanted to go, given that they were leaving. Amine explained that he wanted to find his father, and in exchange for helping them, he asked for their assistance in locating his dad. Shin pointed out that Amine was just a first-year student without even a level 1 license, making it illegal for him to conduct assassin activities without a learner's permit. Amine assured them that he wouldn't kill anyone. He just wanted to find his father. Because of this, Sakamoto questioned what benefit they would gain from bringing a kid along. Shin thought to himself that Sakamoto seemed to see something in Amine as a fellow assassin to even ask that. They were surprised when Amine suddenly started drawing on paper, then showed them a sketch of Kashima. Amine said he was confident in his memory, even if it wasn't at the level of his grandfather's. He explained that this was the image he remembered from the video call with X's dear buddy. Biyoto was pleased to see his grandson's skills, and even Shin was impressed. Meanwhile, Sakamoto quietly observed the drawing and noticed a reflection in the deer's eye. When Seba researched it on his phone, it turned out to be a sign for fried crab curry, a traditional Thai dish. Shin concluded that they were in an abandoned warehouse near a curry restaurant, which would make their search easier. Biyoto tapped Sakamoto and said he would submit an application to the academy for Amine, stating that he was taking a part-time job. Sakamoto then told Amine that first and foremost, he should train and master the register. Amine replied that he was good at learning new things. But he wondered if the register was a special attack because he hadn't heard of it before, deciding to research it later. Meanwhile, Shin asked Seba if he wouldn't be joining them. Despite wanting to, Seba explained that since his fight with Club Jam, his right hand had been out of commission. As he walked away, he said that if a person can't carry their own weight, it lowers everyone's chances of survival. This was according to the first-year textbook, so he would search for information about X on his own instead. Concerned, Shin called out to Seba. When Seba looked back, Shin approached him and promised to find Mafuyu. He vowed to bring him back alive. Grateful, Seba thanked him and told Shin not to hesitate to call if his weapon broke. Back in the present, while walking, Shin thought about Lu and Heisuki, whom they left in charge of the store. 
He hoped they were doing okay. Amine, curious about who they were, asked since he hadn't heard about them. Shin replied that he'd introduce them later, describing them as a pair of good-for-nothing assassins. But they were suddenly surprised to see a large crowd at the Sakamoto store. Amine commented on how popular it seemed. Shin and Sakamoto couldn't believe what they were seeing. Shin wondered why there were so many people, and Sakamoto thought there was only one possible explanation. The store must have gone bankrupt, so his wife Aoi had become desperate and tried an out-of-business sale. Just then, they were noticed outside. There was a long line at the cashier, and it was explained that they had started stocking more booze and snacks, attracting more male customers. Lou added that they had also started serving hot Odin stew, which shocked Sakamoto. Amine was very curious when he saw the Odin, and Lou offered him some, regardless of who he was. When Amine tasted it, he found it delicious and hot. Shin looked for Heisu Ki, and Lu said he was busy with Piber Eats. When asked what that was, they saw Heisu Ki busy using Google Maps to find his next delivery. The next customer was Lady Sugita at number 13, 2nd Street, and her order was detergent, eggs, and Odin. Heisu Ki instructed Pisu Ki, who was in the air, where to deliver using his rifle, which he fired. Lady Sugita was pleased, praising Heisu Ki's perfect aim as always. After receiving her order, she handed the payment to the bird, Pisu Ki. While reloading, Heisu Ki suddenly asked Shin and Sakamoto if they enjoyed JCC. He was on top of the store and said he was excited to hear their stories but was extremely busy now. Their next order was two kilometers away in Nikita town. Shin commented that it was cool and they indeed looked busy. But Shin and Sakamoto thought to themselves that it seemed they weren't needed there anymore. When Amine noticed Pisu Ki's wings and the target mark on Heisu Ki's face, he recognized him as the legendary sniper dragoon talked about at JCC. He wondered what he was doing there. Meanwhile, Shin couldn't believe in that dumb legend. Suddenly, someone poked Sakamoto's cheek and it was his wife Aoi, welcoming him back. Their daughter Hana also approached to welcome him. Amine was shocked at what he saw, confused by the presence of two Sakamotos. Overwhelmed by regular society, he became confused and fainted and so Shin was concerned and told him to hang in there. On the other side, someone was looking at the sky as if filming the birds. It was Kanaguri, curious about why Akira wanted to avenge Ryan Akao so badly. They were on a boat, where there were bound men on the floor with their mouths covered. Akira approached them and apologized to the floaters, explaining that JAA couldn't know Kanaguri's whereabouts. She promised to kill Kanaguri when everything was over. Kanaguri commented that Akira was too soft, and with that approach, X's people would kill her before she could even reach X. Akira looked at him and said he would kill X's people, which is why she brought him along. Kanaguri replied that they had a contract, Akira was the lead in his movie, and he would only take her to X. That was all, so she shouldn't expect his help. Akira asked if he would be satisfied with a dull ending where someone other than X killed her. This made Kanaguri think, admitting it wouldn't be good. He became excited, considering all his actors, Akira, The Order, and Sakamoto's gang. He wondered what would happen when they all came together, saying his camera would capture whoever remains alive at the end. Shifting focus to Amine, he was enjoying a meal with the Sakamoto family. While at the Yakiniku place, Aoi learned about their plan to go to Thailand. Shin explained that they were very close to discovering the location of the enemy's stronghold. Aoi cautioned them to be careful of heat stroke there, while Lu requested mangoes as souvenirs. On the other side, Heisu Ki was telling Amine that he was a sharpshooting major in the assassination department and expressed his pleasure in meeting him. Amine couldn't believe he was talking to the legendary dragoon. Meanwhile, Lu was surprised to learn that Heisu Ki would also be joining them in Thailand, which he confirmed. Shin patted him and said that they would be heading straight into enemy territory this time, so they needed support. They were reminded not to forget their passports, no matter what they did there. Aoi was curious about how they would communicate there, and if they knew English. Sakamoto replied that he was okay with basic conversation, while Shin was confident he could manage since he could read people's emotions. Heisu Ki said he'd be fine with just body language, but Amine mentioned he would study English and tie on the plane. Lu couldn't believe what he said and thought he was on another level. While eating, 
Amine suddenly asked why they wanted to find X. This caused everyone to stop eating and look at him, while Sakamoto remained silent. Shin answered that initially, it was to lift the bounty on Sakamoto's head. When they traced the source of the bounty, it led them to X. But Amine found it weird that X had instituted the bounty, which made Shin pause to think. Amine explained that since Sakamoto had no particular contact with Yuzuki when they were students, why would he put a bounty on him? If Sakamoto could be an obstacle, wouldn't it have been better to leave things as they were? Shin thought about it and agreed. While Lu mentioned that she had also thought about it, but hadn't asked. And so Amine said that there seemed to be only one explanation for this, and that was the split personality his grandfather had mentioned. It was possible that the other personality had a grudge against Sakamoto. Sakamoto remained quiet while Shin was deep in thought. Shin recalled their previous encounter with X, where he asked Sakamoto if he didn't want to kill him again, as well as Nagumo's mention that Sakamoto hadn't killed X before. This made Shin take a drink, thinking there was something he hadn't asked Sakamoto yet, but he thought it wasn't important anymore, as he slammed his glass on the table. Shin added that they would always worry about the shop if they didn't deal with Slur now. They didn't know how much they could trust the JAA, so they needed to sort things out themselves. Heisuki was surprised by how amped up Shin was and asked if he was drunk. Shin asked Sakamoto if he was right, and he replied yes, but there seemed to be some hesitation in his answer, which puzzled Shin. That night, when they returned home, Lu, Heisuki, and Amine were sleeping soundly. Sakamoto was seen dressed up, apparently going out. He adjusted the blanket over his wife and daughter before heading downstairs to leave the house. However, Shin suddenly followed him, asking if he was going to leave them. Sakamoto was surprised that Shin had figured it out. Shin said he had sensed something was off when they were at the barbecue place and asked why. Sakamoto didn't answer immediately and just said he didn't know the reason. Shocked by this, Shin said he couldn't accept that. Sakamoto added that he didn't know why, but he sensed that he should go alone. And usually, his hunches were right. Shin couldn't accept this and said he thought Sakamoto had finally started trusting him. He asked if this was also the reason why Sakamoto hadn't told him about the past with Slur, because he didn't trust him. Sakamoto replied that having information would put Shin's life in danger. He should have learned that at the JCC. Sakamoto said it wasn't good to casually share such things. But Shin was ready to face that. He said it seems Sakamoto was the one who aren't ready to face reality. This shocked Sakamoto. Shin told him that he was underestimating him too much. Because of this, Sakamoto tried to stop him, saying Shin was no match for him. Suddenly, Shin lunged at Sakamoto, but Sakamoto managed to block him. Sakamoto noticed Shin's quick movement to kick him, so he ducked to avoid it, and only his bag was hit. Shin was shocked when Sakamoto suddenly disappeared from in front of him. It turned out Sakamoto was about to punch him in the face. But Sakamoto was surprised when, instead of landing the hit, Shin caught his hand. Shin was wearing the gloves from Natsuki, which allowed him to throw Sakamoto forcefully straight into the store. This shattered the glass wall and destroyed the shelves in the shop. As Sakamoto was falling to the ground, he grabbed an item and used it to throw at Shin. However, Shin nimbly dodged it. Although it grazed his fist, it seemed to have no effect on Shin, who continued approaching to punch again. Sakamoto was surprised by Shin's ability, and as Shin charged, they both stopped suddenly, trapped by a net. They were shocked by what happened, and it turned out Heisuki was responsible for it. Heisuki asked what they were doing, saying this wasn't the time for them to be fighting. He added that Sakamoto couldn't leave alone. Moreover, he thought they were friends. Sakamoto replied that his intuition was always right. But someone suddenly said Heisuki was mistaken. It was actually Aoi who said this, as she had overheard their conversation upstairs. She told her husband that he wasn't aware of his own feelings, which puzzled Sakamoto. Aoi said she understood him. He was afraid of losing Shin and the others because he valued them. Sakamoto thought of Satoda and Akira and agreed that she might be right. But Aoi added that Sakamoto couldn't just leave without talking to them. She told him to think about how it feels to be left behind. Amine and Heisuki didn't expect Aoi to be like this. After her lecture, Aoi took their passports and told the two to talk. She left with Heisuki and Amine. She added that they should make sure to clean up the shop by morning. 
And so Sakamoto and Shin followed her instructions and sat on the floor afterward. Sakamoto praised Shin, saying he had become much stronger now. Shin couldn't accept this and apologized to him. In his mind, he thought the situation was a bit awkward. Nevertheless, he asked Sakamoto if he was angry. Sakamoto looked at him and said he had something he wanted to tell him. So he asked if Shin was willing to listen. It was about his past with Yuzuki. Shin appeared curious and eager to hear about it. We then flash back to when Sakamoto was younger. Ryan is shown trying to light a cigarette, but it seems her lighter is empty, so she shakes it. While casually sitting on top of a train, she gets annoyed that it won't light. Suddenly, someone jumps from a bridge above, landing behind her with a weapon in hand. This person targets Ryan, but she manages to block the weapon with her knife. Ryan looks at the attacker who is Nagumo, whom she asks if he has a light. Nagumo smiles and cocks his gun, saying that's all he has. Ryan quickly grabs and disassembles the gun, then kicks Nagumo in the side. Nagumo counters, but Ryan manages to dodge. We then see a younger Satoda wondering where the three are. She's with some students who mentioned they were hit by paintballs earlier. Meanwhile, those three have been fighting for nine hours. Satoda thinks they're enjoying training outside for a change. The teacher, Satoda, smiles and says it's important to let them blow off steam every now and then. Because if they don't, when stress builds up, they might end up killing someone at school. So their classmates hurry to leave. The scene shifts to the train station, where a man is surprised to notice Sakamoto. Sakamoto has gone down onto the train tracks, so the man warns him that he's not allowed there because a train is coming. However, Sakamoto continues walking straight ahead on the tracks. Meanwhile, Ryan and Nagumo were surprised to see they were about to hit a bridge. So they quickly moved inside the train by breaking through a window. Sakamoto was suddenly already inside, holding a train handle. He swung it to hit the two, who quickly dodged. Ryan was irritated, saying that hurt while Nagumo laughed, noting how into it Sakamoto was. So he suddenly brought out his weapons and said the loser would treat them to lunch. Ryan concentrated to see the path to bring Sakamoto down. Upon seeing it, she quickly moved to kick him in the head. However, Sakamoto suddenly caught them using the train handle. The two were surprised when he suddenly caught their hands into the pull ring. Because of this, Sakamoto was able to pull the two out of the train, causing the glass window to break again. They fell onto the highway, and while in the air, Aoi's guns was pointed at Sakamoto while Nagumo had his knife ready. They were surprised to notice their teacher below. While smiling, she told them to come down, which they didn't expect. Due to the incident, they were expelled. Ryan asked which of the two beside her was expelled, but the answer was all three of them. It was the vice principal who said this. He said many civilians had seen them. Additionally, they had damaged facilities, ignored class rules, and used weapons without permission. This had happened several times already. The vice principal threatened that if he were to be dismissed from his position, he would make sure the three of them would go down with him. Ryan then lit a cigarette and said they were just more passionate about their classes compared to others. Moreover, if she were expelled, her niece would surely stop talking to her. The vice principal interrupted her and told her smoking was not allowed there. Meanwhile, Nagumo blamed Sakamoto for breaking the handrail. But in his defense, he thought it was a weapon because it was so easy to remove. The vice principal took out an envelope and said that, for now, they didn't have enough credits to pass. He handed them the envelope and said he had arranged an extra assignment that would determine if they could pass this year. Most of the teachers thought they should be expelled because they were troublemakers. However, their teacher Satoda was insisting on giving them a special exception. Sakamoto asked what the mission was, and the vice principal replied that it was to kill the target. The information for their mission was inside the envelope, and so they accepted it and left with it. Another teacher there wondered if he had really given them that assignment and nodded. The teacher commented that it was cruel to give them that assignment when no one had ever completed it before. Moreover, the death rate for it was 100%, a surefire way to get rid of those troublemakers. Nevertheless, he agreed with the decision. He said those three had no respect for the teachers, so it was time for them to face the consequences of their actions. Suddenly, Someone told Vice Principal Yamada that the three would be fine, and it turned out to be Satoda. She said that if those three worked together, there was no enemy they couldn't kill. 
At the cafeteria, Ryan proposed that since there was only one target, they should play rock, paper, scissors, macho style. Whoever lost would do the homework. He encouraged Nagumo and Sakamoto to play rock, paper, scissors, but they were disappointed because solo assignments weren't fun. While they were talking, someone suddenly bumped into Ryan's back. She turned around and asked who it was and if he wanted to play macho style rock, paper, scissors. The guy was surprised and said no. Ryan's companions told her not to be mean, but she clarified that she wasn't bullying the guy. The man remained quiet and looked as they leave. Ryan then took the lead and suggested they finish the assignment quickly so they could go to the aquarium or something. At the reception, they were advised that when off campus, they should always ensure to carry their assassin's license. Costs related to their mission are expensed, and they were given a JCC card. Sakamoto was curious about its purpose, while Nagumo wondered why he had never used one before. Meanwhile, Ryan was extremely happy holding the card, explaining that they could use it however they wanted while on assignment. That was apparently the real reason why off-campus assignments were so appealing, she said. While walking, Nagumo asked Takao if she had ever bought a horse racing ticket. She replied that she had pursued a target at the racetrack and killed them there, but it was deductible as an undercover expense. Suddenly, the vice principal called them over, pleased that they were still around. He said he had one more member to add to their group, Kei Yuzuki, a third-year student in the assassination department like them. Ryan seemed to recognize him, which made Nagumo wonder how. Ryan approached Yuzuki and said he was the one who bumped into her earlier. She added that he looked like a nerd but was actually a bad boy. However, Yuzuki removed her hand from embracing him. Because of this Nagumo teased Ryan, saying she was rejected. Annoyed, Ryan called him a wet blanket and said she doesn't jive with the guy. And so Yuzuki apologized to her, while Sakamoto remained quiet in the background. The four proceeded to carry out their mission outside the campus. Their target was the Steel Dragon, the leader of an illegal weapons manufacturing operation. According to Intel, he was hiding in that department store. Ryan couldn't believe the Steel Dragon was his name, finding it cheesy. She wondered if he was an assassin. Nagumo replied that there wasn't much information in the file given to them. He guessed that investigating might be part of their assignment. Upon entering the department store, the metal detector went off, startling them. The concierge said they needed to leave their electronic and metal devices there. Ryan complained about how strict she was, but the concierge explained that violence had been increasing lately, so she apologized. Nagumo couldn't believe they weren't allowed to bring weapons inside, while Sakamoto, seemingly entering for the first time, thought to himself that a department store was just a large store. Once inside, someone suggested they have lunch first. They took the elevator, where there was an elevator operator and an elderly man reading a newspaper. Nagumo was on alert, having noticed something. He suddenly pulled out the old man's wallet and dropped it on the floor. The old man was confused, while Sakamoto and the elevator operator also seemed alert. As the old man bent down to pick up the coins, the operator looked and suddenly drew a gun. However, Sakamoto was quicker, swiftly slicing the operator's neck. They arrived at the second floor, the fashion department. The old man exited while the bleeding operator slumped down. Ryan was curious how Sakamoto smuggled in a knife, but he replied that she herself had said they could use their card in any way they wanted. Ryan laughed and told Nagumo that Sakamoto was indeed nuts. Nagumo laughed too. The operator asked how they knew she was an assassin and who they were, to which Ryan replied that her bloodlust was obvious. She wondered what was special about this department store, while Nagumo demanded information about the man called the Steel Dragon. He threatened her to tell them everything she knew if she didn't want to die. Holding her bleeding neck, the woman said that the Steel Dragon ran the place and the store was just a front. Entry-level staff like her had never met him. She added that they had been monitored since entering, and they surely wouldn't leave alive. The four were shocked, and Nagumo couldn't believe it was an assassin department store. On the second floor, it looked like a normal department store with mannequins, clothing racks, and shoppers. While observing their surroundings, Sakamoto confirmed they were being watched. Ryan suggested Sakamoto and Nagumo go upstairs. She and Yuzuki, whom she called Mr. Emo, will stay down there since she also wanted to look at some clothes. Ryan looked at her companion and told him not to slow her down, then asked his name again. To which he replied, 
Yuzuki. Ryan walked ahead into the store, browsing clothes. Other shoppers were also there looking for outfits. Suddenly, a saleswoman approached Ryan to ask what she was looking for, so Ryan inquired if they had anything tough-looking. As the saleswoman turned to get clothes from a sale rack, a man in a beanie suddenly fired a gun at Ryan, but she dodged. When the man cocked his gun, Ryan grabbed a necklace from a display and used it as a weapon against him. The saleswoman, still turned away, showed an outfit mentioned that the jacket's color was in style this season. Meanwhile, another man attacked Ryan, this time with a knife. But she grabbed a hanging garment and threw it in his face. With his view blocked, she quickly moved behind him and broke his neck. While doing this, she asked the saleswoman if they had any rougher-looking clothes. The saleswoman walked off to look for more options. And so Ryan positioned the man whose neck she broke as a mannequin and hung him to the side. Another man noticed and commented on how cool the man's look was. As Ryan walked with the saleswoman to look at other outfits, a man suddenly appeared from the other side. The saleswoman asked if she wanted a winter outfit. She nodded, saying her current clothes might get dirty. Meanwhile, the man pointed a gun at Ryan's face while she twirled the necklace she had taken earlier around her fist. She used it to punch the man while holding his gun with her left hand. The saleswoman agreed with Ryan's earlier statement, but another man emerged from between the clothes on the rack holding a gun, just as the saleswoman looked in that direction. Ryan quickly tied the man up using her necklace and hid him among the clothes. The saleswoman mentioned it was a new arrival, and Ryan said she liked it. When Ryan asked to try it on, the saleswoman agreed. However, while they were talking, the man Ryan had strangled with her necklace was delirious. Afterward, inside the fitting room, the saleswoman outside said to let her know if Ryan needed a different size, and Ryan agreed. Two men were actually with Ryan inside. She grabbed one by the hair and asked where their boss, the steel dragon, was. She threatened to kill him and find someone else if he didn't answer. Suddenly, someone tapped Ryan on the shoulder, startling her. It turned out to be her companion, Yuzuki. Shifting to the third floor, electronics department. Customers were puzzled by the absence of staff at the register, but Nagumo and Sakamoto were actually hidden there, restraining some men. Nagumo deduced that the assassins were mixed in with regular staff on each floor. Moreover, some were posing as customers, making the situation tricky. Meanwhile, as Sakamoto held one man in a chokehold, he couldn't believe what Nagumo was saying. Suddenly, Nagumo emerged and operated the cash register, telling a customer they owed 1,300 yen, then thanking them. Sakamoto was amazed that Nagumo knew how to use the register, to which Nagumo replied there's no need for him to learn it because he'd never work as a cashier in his life. A man sitting in a massage chair behind them suddenly commented that they wouldn't become top-notch assassins with killing skills alone. He asked if they were from JCC and inquired about Itsuko Satoda. The two looked at him, and Nagumo asked who he was, calling him Gramps. He wondered if this man knew their teacher, Satoda. Nagumo thought to himself how well the man hid his bloodlust. The man then pressed a button on the massage chair and said he had invited Satoda to join his organization, but she refused. Sakamoto directly asked if he was the Steel Dragon. The man in overall stood up and asked if Steel Dragon wasn't a cool name. He introduced himself as Kendaka and said he led a group known as the Order. He then asked which of them was stronger. Thinking it would be troublesome, Nagumo pointed at Sakamoto, while Sakamoto himself stated that he was stronger than him. The two were curious about what the Order was, as they hadn't heard of it before, and they confirmed whether he was indeed the Steel Dragon. While holding a picture of the target, Nagumo noticed Kendaka's frontal bone, eye socket, and nasal and ethmoid bone. He remarked that if Kendaka wanted to disguise himself, he should start with his bone structure. Nagumo added that he was in the intelligence gathering department at school, so Kendaka couldn't fool him. Kendaka was surprised by the old photograph. Because of this, Nagumo moved quickly and told Sakamoto they'll finish this. He grabbed Kendaka's overalls while Sakamoto ran to attack him. However, Kendaka suddenly vanished from their sight. He had run incredibly fast down an aisle while the two were thrown off balance. Kendaka braked at the end while Nagumo and Sakamoto landed, confused. Nagumo asked if Sakamoto had seen him, but Sakamoto said no. Suddenly, Kendaka appeared behind them, saying he's super fast. 
When they turned to look, he vanished again and reappeared in front of them. Kandaka declared that slow people like them had no chance against him, the fastest living assassin. Nagumo and Sakamoto quickly attacked Kandaka, but both failed as he suddenly fixed his shoe. They hit the wall so hard with their pins that it cracked. Meanwhile, Nagumo wondered if it was possible for a person to be that fast. Kandaka said that if they wanted to run that fast, they'd need what he was wearing. Sakamoto figured out that Kandaka had special shoes enabling his speed. And so Kandaka boasted about his light speed shoes, calling them his trusty partners. On the side, some customers noticed them. A child pointed out that he wanted shoes like Kandaka's, but his mother replied that he was too old to wear Velcro shoes. Kandaka then lifted his glasses and mentioned that Satoda had told him about them. He said he'd give them a workout and told them to come at him prepared to die. Nagumo wondered about their assignment, questioning if their teachers had set them up. Sakamoto, meanwhile, was only concerned with Kandaka's shoes, thinking they looked cool. Back on the second floor, Ryan asked Yuzuki why his hand was on her shoulder. He replied that those men weren't their target, so she shouldn't kill people senselessly. Surprised, Ryan questioned what constituted meaningful killing and if Yuzuki decided what was good or evil killing. She called him freaky. Yuzuki responded that all killing was evil, so they should avoid it whenever possible. Ryan smiled and asked why he enrolled in assassin school, suggesting he should drop out if he wasn't cut out for it. They were interrupted by noises from above, making them curious about whether the others are having trouble. Ryan exited the fitting room, telling Yuzuki to have fun shopping, calling him a wuss and giving him the middle finger. However, Yuzuki didn't respond. Meanwhile, in the middle of the department store, Nagumo, Sakamoto, and Kandaka were fighting. A pillar on one floor was already damaged. Kandaka taunted them, saying their movements were boring like a kiddie roller coaster. He jumped nimbly between floors while Sakamoto was falling. Kandaka suddenly grabbed Sakamoto by his clothes and threw him forcefully down the escalators of each floor. Kandaka advised them to use the whole stage widely and freely. Sakamoto, resilient, managed to stay alert despite crashing through the escalators. Upstairs, Ryan focused on the enemy, concentrating on the killing paths towards him. Kandaka noticed this and quickly moved to attack her, surprising nearby customers. Kandaka thought to himself that her killing pathway wasted no movement, putting him on the defensive. He wondered what she was seeing. As Ryan declared it was too late for him, someone suddenly threw a washing machine at his head, shocking him. Seizing the opportunity, Nagumo and Sakamoto simultaneously attacked and kicked Kandaka while he was inside the machine. Meanwhile, back in the fitting room on the second floor, Yuzuki approached the injured men who had fought with Ryan earlier. His expression was indescribable. On the other side, Sakamoto, Ryan, and Nagumo were now together. Ryan was curious about who Kandaka was, while Kandaka asked them if they wanted to join the order. Ryan was curious about who he was, while Nagumo wondered how he was still standing after he had kicked him so hard. Kandaka stretched and said they could give their answer after he beat them up. Ryan warned about his incoming attack, so the three quickly dodged and jumped when he ran towards them. However, Kandaka caught Nagumo's foot, who thought he had become faster now. Kandaka asked if he had lied earlier when he questioned them about who was the toughest among them. Although he held Nagumo's foot, Nagumo swiftly moved to kick him in the head, which Kandaka managed to avoid. Ryan helped by throwing a knife at Nagumo, which he had used against him. Nevertheless, Kandaka told them not to underestimate their elders. Suddenly, the two disappeared, and it turned out that Kandaka had thrown Nagumo with tremendous force to the other side of the department store. As a result, Nagumo hit the railing and floor multiple times before ending up in the mattress store. Because of this, Nagumo thought that Kandaka really did know their teacher, Satoda. He believed it truly wasn't an ordinary assignment. Moreover, he wondered what the order was, as it sounded fishy. He just said that their teachers had tricked them. He trusted that Akao and Sakamoto could handle the situation, so he decided to strategize first. And so he laid down on the bed there. When the sales lady asked if it was comfortable, he answered that it was the best. On the other side, Ryan faced Kandaka. He threw a knife at her face, but instead of dodging, she simply caught the knife and kicked him. The force was so strong that it broke a pillar there. 
Ryan was annoyed while Kendaka realized that she was the one with special vision among them, and she's doing the best of the three. He suddenly disappeared from her sight when Sakamoto was about to attack. Ryan, unwilling to let him escape, chased after him. When she caught up and was about to strike with the knife, she ended up slicing a bottle of Tabasco sauce. As a result, Ryan got hot sauce in her eyes, causing her to fall to her knees in pain. Kandaka, holding two more bottles of hot sauce, said that those with good eyes would surely react quickly to anything. Sakamoto suddenly appeared behind him and forcefully pushed him straight into the elevator. He said that in a confined space, speed wasn't important. Kandaka was confident and challenged him to try it. When Sakamoto punched, Kandaka moved like the flash, spinning rapidly inside the cramped elevator. He taunted that he had told Sakamoto he couldn't catch him with such wimpy moves. Nevertheless, Sakamoto managed to hit him on the nose. He said that finally, he was getting used to him. Kandaka replied that he was fun, just as the elevator doors opened. He said it was time to shift into max gear. This time, he spun around the entire department store at an incredible speed. He moved so fast that Sakamoto couldn't follow him with his eyes. Kandaka asked him where he was looking, saying that if he just stood there staring into space, he'd surely get bulldozed. Suddenly, someone approached Sakamoto at high speed and it was Yuzuki, which surprised Kandaka. Because of this, Kandaka quickly dodged, not hitting Yuzuki, who remained poker-faced. Kandaka stopped, thinking he was a civilian and that's why he avoided him. And so he was curious if he was their friend. Suddenly, his back hurt, which he attributed to his emergency breaking and possibly his age. While Ryan was rubbing her eyes to remove the hot sauce, she asked Yuzuki if he had seen the enemy. She also questioned why Yuzuki suddenly decided to help now. Yuzuki replied that they shouldn't follow a fast target with their eyes. They should anticipate its movements based on the surroundings. As for helping, he said he didn't want them complaining to the teachers that he was just loafing around. Ryan hadn't expected this response. She laughed, asking why she would bother snitching him. She says it was a dumb thing to worry about. Meanwhile, Nagumo praised them from above for their nice work. But Ryan just told him to hurry up and come down. In Kandaka's mind, he realized that Yuzuki wasn't just good at evaluating his surroundings. But he also had no fear, jumping in front of him despite his incredible speed. He thought that's what you'd call an ambush. But he was puzzled when someone suddenly ran beside him, and it turned out to be Sakamoto, who unexpectedly wrapped a long banner around Kendaka's body. After that, Sakamoto spun Kendaka around inside and suddenly threw him upwards. Kendaka went straight to the higher floor, but the impact was so strong that it created a hole, causing him to fall back to the ground. Sakamoto remarked that it was indeed useful to take advantage of the entire space. While lying on the floor, Kandaka complimented Sakamoto, saying not bad. Nagumo declared the mission accomplished, saying he was tired. Ryan couldn't believe it, pointing out that he hadn't done anything. He replied that at least they wouldn't be expelled now. Meanwhile, Kandaka, still conscious, managed to sit up despite being severely beaten. He said they knew nothing, which shocked Ryan. She was surprised he was still alive and asked what he meant. He replied that even if they killed him, they couldn't return to school because they were sent there to die. They were stunned by this revelation. Ryan demanded an explanation. Kandako explained that the assignment's purpose was to dispose of problem students. The school wanted to eliminate uncontrollable students by sending them to him. However, if they proved useful as fighters, he could recruit them. He claimed it was a win-win arrangement since they were always shorthanded in their field. He added that returning to school was no longer an option. If they thought he was lying, he suggested they call the JCC, saying they might already be off the attendance list. Because of this, Nagumo called their teacher to report the assignment's completion. The teacher was surprised they were alive and called the vice principal. Ryan and the others were shocked by their teacher's response. In the faculty room, the teachers couldn't believe they had survived, as no one had ever completed that assignment before. Satota laughed, saying she told them they could do it. Ryan then asked if this meant they were expelled. Nagumo was concerned that without a diploma, they couldn't get a Type 2 license. And so Kandaka called them over and proposed a deal if they really wanted to return to school. Sakamoto was curious if he could get them readmitted. Kandaka then asked if they knew Yatsumura, their school's professor emeritus. 
Sakamoto couldn't remember him, but Nagumo recalled he was the one who came once a year for special lectures. Ryan thought of him as the super tough-looking old man. Kandaka revealed that Yatsumura was also part of their order and a co-founder. Nagumo asked if Kandaka could negotiate with the Professor Emeritus for them, and he confirmed he could. Ryan inquired about the nature of the order. Kandaka explained it was a special organization reporting directly to the JAA. In other words, they were the JAA's strongest fighters, but there were only four of them in Japan right now. She responded with a simple O, which surprised Kandaka. He told her to react more impressively to that information. Ryan then asked Kandaka what he needed from them to get them readmitted to school. She added that she wasn't interested in the order nonsense. Kandaka just smiled and told them to follow him so they could see for themselves. Moving to the lower level of a train station, someone in a suit was waiting and said it took him long enough. Kandaka called her Kondo and apologized. Kondo was annoyed because he had been keeping the VIP waiting. He was curious about what was going on. As Kandaka was in a wheelchair and had others with him. So he said it was just minor business and asked her not to worry about it. Kondo replied that they had an assignment from the chairman. Kandaka just smiled and said not to worry because he had brought stand-ins, pointing to the four. Kondo couldn't believe it because they were just kids. Ryan was irritated by this comment. Kondo, concerned, approached Kandaka about the higher-ups finding out since it was an order assignment. Kandaka assured him they'd finish quickly and no one would know. Ryan was annoyed, asking why they had to do Kandaka's job. He replied it was their fault his back hurt, so they needed to take responsibility. Ryan couldn't believe it while Nagumo said this could get them readmitted to school. On the other hand, Sakamoto was hungry while Yuzuki remained silent. And so Sakamoto asked who they needed to kill. But Kandaka told him to chill because it wasn't an assassination assignment. It was the opposite. They needed to escort the VIP to the airport. A chubby man with glasses exited the car. Sakamoto was surprised it was a bodyguard assignment. While Ryan asked who that bozo was, but the man remained silent. Kondo was irritated and told her to watch her language with a JAA exec. Meanwhile, Kandaka said they don't do that at school, but it should be easier than fighting him. Kondo asked if Kandaka was serious as they were just brats. She worried something might happen. Suddenly Ryan noticed something and moved, pulling the VIP down by his tie because someone had shot at him. Luckily, Ryan blocked the bullet with her knife. Kondo was impressed by what happened. Ryan spotted the sniper 300 meters away at 2 o'clock and informed Sakamoto. He borrowed Kondo's handgun, despite Kondo's protest about the range. Sakamoto cocked it saying he'd make it work. He took a stance, spun around, and fired towards the building where Ryan had spotted the sniper. Impressively, he managed to hit the sniper in the head, even breaking the window where the sniper was positioned. Meanwhile, two men with blades suddenly appeared behind them. Nagumo confronted them, drawing his own blade weapons and attacking both simultaneously. Kondo was astounded, saying this wasn't student-level work. Meanwhile, a car suddenly braked behind them, surprising Ryan. It was Yuzuki driving, who said he didn't like to drive. Ryan was pleased and praised him. Inside the car, Ryan told Yuzuki they were being chased and to speed up. With what had happened, Kondo thought to herself that it might be time to look for a new job. Back at the car, they were all cramped up. Kandaka complained, asking Sakamoto to move his seat up due to his sore back. But Sakamoto refused. On the side, Nagumo grumbled about his heavy seatmate, while Ryan, squeezed in the middle, just laughed. She apologized to the VIP for the commotion, assuring him they'd get him safely to the airport. Suddenly, a voice inside the VIP spoke, saying it was hot, and a child asked her mother if it was okay now. Ryan was puzzled. The mother agreed, and after pressing something, the body of the chubby VIP melted away, revealing a mother and child inside. Everyone was shocked and curious about their identity. They couldn't believe that even Kendaka had no idea about this. The mother and daughter seemed relieved after removing their disguise as a fat man. Kendaka asked them who they were. Meanwhile, Ryan couldn't believe that the man they had rescued had turned into a woman. She was also puzzled that Kendaka had no idea who they were. Behind, Sakamoto was curious with their disguise. The mother spoke up and asked if he was Kendaka. He was surprised at how she knew him. 
She introduced herself as Ayamo and expressed her pleasure in meeting him. She said she was the wife of the JAA chairman and her companion was their daughter, Konomi. She added that she learned about Kendaka through her husband and Yatsumura. Kendaka couldn't believe that the chairman had a daughter as he was supposed to be single. I explained that information about them was top secret, known only to a few people, but Kendaka still couldn't accept this. He remarked that they looked like normal civilians and wondered what the chairman was thinking. When Sakamoto asked if he was angry, Kendaka replied that of course he was. He explained that people like them who live in the underworld shouldn't involve civilians. If something were to happen, they could face danger, but civilians couldn't protect themselves. Once involved in the underworld, there was no escape. Sakamoto understood his point. However, she mentioned that there have been many anti-J activity lately, and because of that, it seemed they were facing a major battle. So, before that happened, she wanted to take her daughter to a safe place outside of Japan. She pleaded and begged Kendaka, but he couldn't answer immediately. He scratched his head, saying they couldn't just throw them out of the car at this point. Moreover, this was a direct assignment from the chairman. He wondered if the kids with him could handle such a mission. Meanwhile, young Konomi noticed the letters and pictures on Nagumo's arm. And so he was surprised by this. Nagumo just smiled and said he drew them using a pen, but they come off when he bathes. So, he had to redraw them every day, which was a hassle. The child replied that those weren't just drawings but tattoos. She knew they were painful, which surprised Nagumo that she already knew about them. Ryan told Nagumo not to be stupid. Children her age don't like being treated like little kids. Someone then asked Akao why she was fidgeting, but she just asked Konomi if she was six years old. Konomi nodded in response. Akao looked at her and said she was already a big kid. She told her to tell that jerk Nagumo not to treat her like a baby. Suddenly, Yuzuki interjected, asking if Akao had a child. Akao was shocked and denied it, asking what kind of idiot he was. But while focused on driving, Yuzuki replied that she seemed to know a lot about children, and so she clarified that she had a niece. In the back of the car, Kendaka gave Sakamoto a mission to make Konomi laugh. Sakamoto was shocked by this, while a cow was amused and encouraged him to try to make the child laugh. Because of this, Sakamoto put his leg into his t-shirt and puffed out his cheeks, saying he was the chubby assassin. Hey, that's pretty good. Kendaka said that joke was worth zero points, while a cow commented it was boring. She asked what kind of comedian he was. Meanwhile, Nagumo regretted not recording what Sakamoto did. Nevertheless, Konomi was trying to hold back her laughter, and they were surprised that it worked. For some reason, they seemed to be on the same wavelength as the child. Sakamoto thought to himself that kids must like fatties, and thus, mission accomplished. While on the road, another car could be seen. Inside it, there was a man with a plastic bag full of drink cans. The driver asked if he was collecting trash, commenting that it made the car smell bad. The man replied that it was a good deed. His companion became curious about this. The man believed that the gods of killing were always watching. If they did good deeds, he thought, killing would become easier. He held a good deed notebook where he had listed five points for picking up trash. Something in his hand that sounded like a bomb beeped when he pressed it, and he said that at the brink of death, their good deeds would determine whether they lived or died. His companion couldn't believe he was doing good deeds to support his evil work, commenting on how ironic it was. The scarred man threw what he was holding onto the road, saying that killing could be good or evil. He said it was up to the gods to decide. A cow's head was sticking out of their car, and she noticed something being thrown from the car in front of them. She was shocked when she recognized the item and told her companions there was a hand grenade 50 meters ahead. Everyone was startled, especially I. Kandaka instructed Nagumo and a cow to get the mother and daughter to safety. The grenade slowly opened and rolled under their car. However, from inside the car, Sakamoto managed to create a hole to catch and stop it from exploding. A cow was annoyed because now the grenade was inside their car. But Sakamoto cocked a gun with his mouth and said there was no problem. He suddenly shot at the windshield while holding the grenade with his left hand. He had aimed at the manhole cover on the road to open it. As they passed over it, he dropped the grenade into the hole, where it exploded after they had driven a bit further. Sakamoto said it was time to get to work. 
The scarred man was impressed and remarked that it seemed that man had done some good deeds. The enemy's car was right in front of them, so everyone prepared themselves. Meanwhile, Konomi was impressed by Sakamoto's actions, while her mother was nervous. In the enemy's car, the driver told his companion, Higuchi, that he had screwed up. Higuchi replied to the driver, Koba, that the man, referring to Sakamoto, had done many good deeds. Koba said their orders were to capture them alive. While scratching his head with a knife, Higuchi said that if they always do good deeds, they won't die easily. Moreover, if they could kill someone who had done many good deeds, they would acquire their virtue points. Now, Higuchi claimed to have 50,000 virtue points, and because of that, even if he fell into Niagara Falls, he wouldn't die. Koba remarked that it was a somewhat evil rule. Suddenly, Higuchi opened the car door and got out, which surprised Sakamoto. Higuchi attacked and smashed the windshield of their car to get the mother and daughter inside. It was visible that his arms and hands were armed, which shocked Sakamoto, Nagumo, Akao, and Kendaka. Higuchi then blew up the car they were riding in, forcing them to jump out. However, he managed to capture the mother and daughter and took them away. He said that finishing off scumbag assassins was worth five virtue points. However, Higuchi was surprised when he noticed I behind him, suddenly pulling out a blade to attack him, causing him to drop young Konomi. Higuchi said he would lose virtue points for deceiving people. He was shocked to realize that Nagumo had disguised himself as I in an instant. Nagumo caught Konomi and told her to close her eyes. She thought he was her mother, but Nagumo replied that he was the master of disguise. The van driver where they landed wondered why it seemed like something had fallen on top of his vehicle. While atop the vehicle, Nagumo asked if Konomi was okay, and she said yes. They were puzzled when smoke suddenly enveloped the surroundings, which turned out to be from Koba, who said he wouldn't let them escape. Nagumo quickly took off his polo shirt to make a mask, tying it around Konomi's face because it was poison gas. He thought to himself that he had inhaled a little poison gas, but he didn't think the child could hold her breath for long. So, he jumped onto the road while carrying the child. However, Nagumo didn't expect Higuchi to be there to catch them. Nagumo and Konomi ended up in the back of the car Koba was driving. Nagumo was hugging Konomi, and when they got to the back seat, they asked each other if they were okay. Meanwhile, Koba ordered them to stay down, or he'd fill the car with poison gas. Nagumo replied that someone was following him and was surprised when he looked in the side mirror. Akao and Sakamoto were on a motorcycle chasing them. When Akao asked if Sakamoto had a lighter, he said no. They then sped up to follow the enemy's car. While driving, Koba threw something onto the road, causing an explosion that made the car swerve to the side near Akao. Sakamoto jumped to get on that car. As it spun in the air, he came out on the other side of the door where Akao was backing up. A cow's motorcycle skills were shown as she lit her cigarette while drifting. Meanwhile, Koba became worried when he noticed Sakamoto carrying a traffic sign. He used it to puncture the car and target Koba, but Koba quickly escaped. Koba was annoyed by what happened. Sakamoto then peeked inside the car and asked if Nagumo was okay, but Nagumo just replied, the steering wheel. However, before they could help, Higuchi suddenly rushed in from behind. Sakamoto wondered what he should do, while Higuchi was excited to attack him because he would get many points from him. Suddenly, a cow's motorcycle appeared. She used it to fly and push Higuchi straight into an oncoming bus on the road. The two went straight into the bus, and luckily there were no passengers inside. A cow spun in the air, landed, and braked on the road, throwing away her cigarette and exhaling smoke. Kandaka then arrived in a car with I and told them to get in. A cow commented that he was late, while Sakamoto carried Konomi and Nagumo. And that concluded their introduction. Higuchi was frustrated because his virtue points were too low to kill them. To which Koba replied sarcastically to Higuchi as he realized how tough the order was. They were approximately 100 kilometers away from reaching the airport. While on the road, Kandaka reported from the center car. He was talking to Sakamoto and asked if there were any enemies from behind. While on the motorcycle, Sakamoto replied that there were none, then asked if he could remove his helmet because it was extremely hot. Kandaka then asked him to confirm if he had a motorcycle license. Meanwhile, a cow watched Sakamoto from the car's side mirror, 
seemingly envious. She asked if he didn't like motorcycles and if he wanted to switch with her, but it wasn't allowed. Kandaka scolded her, telling her to stop pestering about the motorcycle and focus on the mission instead. Nagumo, who was also in the car, told Sakamoto to let a cow ride the motorcycle later in the parking lot, and he agreed. A cow became annoyed and said not to treat her like a child, or she'd kill them. It was Yuzuki driving their car with a cow. She said there was only one good thing about riding shotgun, and that was being able to kick back and smoke a ciggy. Because of this, Kandaka was furious and told her to get serious. He asked if they had forgotten their roles and reminded them to remember what he had explained earlier. It was shown that they had a meeting before this in a parking lot. Kandaka said they would change their strategy based on how the enemy attacked them earlier. He explained that they would convoy in three vehicles. He assigned a cow and Yuzuki to the front car. Using a cow's wide vision and Yuzuki's spatial awareness, they would be the group scouts. If they detected anything unusual, they should report it immediately. Despite Kandaka's back pain, he said Nagumo could respond to any situation. The two of them would protect the subjects from the middle car. Nagumo and Konomi were pleased to be on the same team. Last but not least, Sakamoto was placed at the rear. He would be responsible for those tailing them, and he agreed. However, a cow didn't agree because she wanted to ride the motorcycle. And she argued that Sakamoto's eyes were good too, so he should be in front. Sakamoto pushed her away from his bike, and as a result, Kandaka told them to stop bickering. Back to the present, Yuzuki suddenly mentioned that Sakamoto was the best fighter among the three of them. A cow couldn't accept this and asked if he was looking for a fight, to which he replied no. Yuzuki added that the attack would surely come from behind, which was probably why Kandaka placed Sakamoto at the rear. A cow was extremely irritated and told him not to patronize her. She said that if they put her and Sakamoto in a room with no clothes and only a knife, she would surely win. Yuzuki was surprised by this statement and asked where that scenario came from. But a cow paused and said that, actually, if they were in a regular room full of various objects, in a hundred fights, Sakamoto would definitely win every time. Yuzuki replied that it seemed the gap between them wasn't that big. But a cow said that she knew how to utilize weapons to the maximum. Sakamoto knew how to use anything on site as a weapon. And Nagumo did everything using coordination and skill. So, in the current situation, Sakamoto was indeed the strongest. Out of the blue, a cow apologized to Yuzuki. When he asked what for, she said it was because she had said he would be a lousy assassin earlier at the department store. She admitted she had just been a jerk, which surprised Yuzuki. He thought she was the type of person who would say such things and then forget about them. She replied not to talk to her as if she were an idiot. Yuzuki was then curious by her sudden change of heart. A cow said there was no reason. It was just that their mission was dangerous, and she didn't want to have any regrets, that's all. Yuzuki responded that it was admirable that she worried about other people before she died. A cow was shocked and asked why he had to say it like that. And so Yuzuki added that she didn't need to apologize. Actually, he was relieved when she said he wasn't suited to be an assassin. A cow was puzzled by this. But for Yuzuki, it was as if she had said he was a decent person because of that. A cow was drinking water, and when she heard this, she suddenly laughed and spat water directly onto Yuzuki's face. He was very surprised by what happened. A cow apologized while wiping away her tears from laughing so hard. She said he's killing her. He looked like so glum but was extremely positive. Yuzuki was concerned about her saying she would kill him and asked if she was okay. He wondered if she had choked because she was carsick or because of her cigarette. A cow then wiped his face while he was driving and told him he was so clueless, but in a different way from Sakamoto. Yuzuki was curious about how he was clueless, moving to the center car where Kendaka and Nagumo were. Nagumo was playing with Konomi and asked which hand was hiding something. Konomi pointed to his right hand, but Nagumo said the correct answer was in Konomi's pocket. Konomi was shocked and asked him to repeat the trick. While driving, Kandaka couldn't believe how relaxed Nagumo was and how difficult it seemed to read his thoughts. Because of this, he asked Nagumo why he had transferred to the assassin department from the spy department initially. Nagumo replied that his family had been in the spying game for generations, so he defaulted there. But when he saw a cow in Sakamoto, he thought the assassin department would be more fun. 
Kandaka asked if that was the only reason. To which Nagumo answered that, as a former spy apprentice, he thought Kandaka's theory was correct, which puzzled Kandaka. Nagumo asked if Kandaka thinks there was a spy in the JAA. Kandaka said there was no evidence of that. But Nagumo mentioned that the VIP was actually the chairman's mother and child. Kandaka, who was in the order, didn't know this, but some random assassins knew, which was why they were attacked. This meant they already had a trail. It was obvious that there was an information leak because of this. Suddenly, Nagumo stopped talking, and Kandaka became concerned for him. But it turned out he was just carsick and had laid down on Ai's lap. So, she asked Kandaka to slow down the car a bit. Kandaka was irritated because Nagumo seemed too relaxed. She then asked if her knees were too high, and Nagumo replied they were fine. Kandaka thought to himself that Nagumo was still a child in some ways. Now, they were only 80 kilometers away to the airport. So, a cow suggested they play a word game, but Kandaka refused. Meanwhile, at JAA headquarters, Yatsumura told the chairman it was time for their general meeting. While cleaning his gun, the chairman said yes. Yatsumura recognized his gun as a Nagant M1895 from the former Soviet Union. Suichiyamo, the JCC chairman, replied that it was just a knockoff from a thrift shop, but well-made. He said it was a bit complicated for a revolver, but putting it together was relaxing for him. Yatsumura responded that it clearly wasn't fixed yet, so he asked if he had broken it. To alleviate his concern, he mentioned that Kandaka was protecting his family and could be relied upon. It seemed Suichi was surprised that Kandaka was there. In truth, he said he would have preferred to have Yatsumura with them. Yatsumura answered that was too much, as he needed to stay there with him. Suichi was concerned because, although Kandaka was talented, he looked like a thug and might scare his daughter Konomi. But Yatsumura said to let Kandaka worry about them. He was the head of the JAA. Suddenly, someone commented that Yatsumura shouldn't be so heartless, which surprised him. The curly-haired man said that Yatsumura's son Amine was still young, asking if he didn't worry about him. Yatsumura then told Asaki that if he mentioned his or the chairman's family again while the door was open, he would surely kill him. Asaki apologized and agreed, saying they didn't know who might overhear them. He left, saying he'd be more careful next time because he didn't want to die yet. Because of this, the chairman told Yatsumura not to be too nervous, as only JA execs were there. But Yatsumura disagreed, saying he didn't trust Asaki. Nevertheless, the chairman told him to be nice. If he were to die, one of them would be next in line to become chairman. Back to the chairman's mother and child, they made a stopover. Kandaka said they would rest for two minutes and then leave immediately. He ordered Sakamoto to buy food, while Yuzuki walked away to a distance. When he reached a corner, he made a phone call. Someone asked him if the mission was going according to plan. Yuzuki didn't answer immediately and said this wasn't what they had discussed. He mentioned that he hadn't been told the VIP was a member of the general public. The person he was talking to was Asaki, who said he knew Yuzuki would back out if he learned he was being sent to kill an innocent mother and child. He added that he was just being nice as his older brother. Nevertheless, Yuzuki said he was going to quit the mission. His brother Asaki couldn't believe it. He asked what the point of their infiltration into the JCC was if he quit now. Honestly, he said, he hadn't expected the assignment of Yuzuki to this bodyguard mission to go smoothly, but they couldn't afford to waste this chance. Yuzuki's brother called him Kei and said that if he insisted on quitting, he would respect his decision as an older brother. However, if that happened, he said he would feel bad because he wouldn't be able to fulfill his promise. Therefore, he told Yuzuki to complete his mission as a spy. Asaki told Yuzuki to kidnap the mother and child. Yuzuki couldn't accept this, saying he couldn't harm innocent people. Too bad, his brother replied, mentioning Alkamar Orphanage. But Yuzuki wasn't finished, he suggested he could take out Kandaka instead. Asaki told him not to disrupt the plan, which was to lure the chairman by holding his family hostage. Wasn't the point for him to become the new chairman? Yuzuki asked. He then explained that Kandaka was the leader of the order while Yatsumura was the chairman's right-hand man. Both were unavoidable obstacles to the insurgency. So, Yuzuki said he'd take care of them. There was no need for hostages, but his brother told him not to be delusional. If that were possible, he should have done it already. However, 
Yuzuki explained that Kandaka was injured. He could handle him now, even at the cost of his own life. There was no need to involve the chairman's wife and child. Asaki accepted his proposal, but said he'd impose additional risk. If Yuzuki failed, Asaki would kill someone from Alkamar Orphanage. He thought about the silver-haired kid who gave the staff headaches. Maybe it was a good opportunity. Yuzuki couldn't accept that Asaki was thinking about Gaku. Suddenly, a cow pointed a gun at Yuzuki's back, surprising him. She told him to put down his phone and place both hands behind his head. Yuzuki was nervous, wondering if she had heard their conversation. He thought he could take her down, but his hands were shaking. A cow suddenly burst into laughter, put her arm around Yuzuki, and said she'd kill him from laughing so hard. His expression was so serious, and he didn't move. His reaction was so genuine. She then walked away, telling Yuzuki to call his girlfriend later because they were leaving. Or maybe it was his mother, she joked. Yuzuki agreed and said he'd follow, but his brother had already hung up the phone. After the quick stopover, they headed straight to the airport. According to Kandaka, they were less than 60 kilometers from the airport now, so they shouldn't let their guard down. If they were feeling sleepy after lunch, they should speak up. He jokingly said he'd happily put a bullet in them. They all acknowledged this and said Roger. While driving, Yuzuki took out a photo, and a cow asked what it was. He replied that they were his friends from the orphanage where he grew up. After their mission, he said he'd take a break from the JCC and spend time with them. A cow was pleased to hear this and told him to make sure he didn't die. Suddenly, a cow noticed something on the bridge above them. It was a sniper targeting them, and so she pushed Yuzuki's face down to save him, as the sniper was aiming at him. A cow said it was that good deed collecting bastard again. Higuchi told them to do a good deed and hand over the wife and child. However, both Sakamoto and Nagumo shot at him. So, he left his position to avoid the shots, while pressing what looked like a bomb detonator. Because of this, a part of the bridge they were supposed to cross to the airport exploded. When a cow, who was in the front, saw this, she switched places with Yuzuki, who was surprised by her action. She stepped on the gas and drove at high speed towards the exploded part of the bridge to cross to the other side. She asked Kandaka if the mother and child were okay, saying something about before the bridge collapsed. She couldn't finish her sentence because someone suddenly appeared beside them. It was Kandaka, carrying the mother and child, who had jumped across the large gap in the bridge. A cow was impressed by his speed. I apologize to Kandaka, saying she had gained a bit of weight recently while Konomi asked about his back, and in his mind, Kandaka thought his back was still messed up. Higuchi said he still hadn't stopped collecting good deeds, and that saving a person was worth six points. While on top of the car, Nagumo wondered where Sakamoto was. But a cow asked him when he had jumped up there. Yuzuki then said it was impossible for Sakamoto to cross because the bridge was destroyed, but a cow said he would find a way. On the other side, Higuchi was chasing Sakamoto and told him he couldn't leave. But as Sakamoto neared the end of the damaged bridge, he shot at a rope in front of him, causing it to break. While still on his motorcycle, he grabbed the cut rope while carrying the bike and noticed a small ferry below. So, he used it to gain momentum before revving his motorcycle up the bridge wall to climb. When he reached the top, he let go of the rope, surprising his companions. He landed on the other side of the bridge where his team was, without any difficulty. He then apologized to them for making them wait. But a cow replied that he should have taken his time because she still wanted to smoke. On the opposite side of the bridge, Higuchi couldn't believe what had happened and questioned the gods of killing. He took out his list of good deeds and said he had been collecting them to make good kills, but wondered why it still wasn't enough. He couldn't accept this and if that was how it was going to be, he said he would steal their virtue points instead. He declared that those good deed thieves wouldn't escape. So, he used the weapon on his hands, which he called hot hands, to rise into the air and fly towards the other side. When he got there, he said he needed to meet up with Koba immediately. Suddenly, the car door behind him opened and Sakamoto emerged. Higuchi was surprised and didn't expect Sakamoto's quick attack from behind. Sakamoto said Higuchi was finished. But Higuchi replied that they should just see who was more virtuous between them. Meanwhile, Yuzuki was thinking seriously. Higuchi stood up again and called out to Sakamoto. He asked how many virtue points Sakamoto had accumulated. 
Sakamoto was curious about why Higuchi was collecting points for good deeds. Suddenly, Higuchi jumped and asked if Sakamoto wanted to know, mentioning that Koba hadn't asked him about it. He explained that before he started collecting points for good deeds, he was just a third-rate assassin. Higuchi then threw a powerful punch at Sakamoto, who managed to dodge it, causing the punch to hit the floor instead. Higuchi continued, saying that one day, he did a good deed on a whim, or perhaps it was a message from the gods. What he had done five years ago was to pick up some trash from the ground and throw it in the garbage bin. The following day, during their mission, everyone died except for him. That's when he realized that if he built up good karma, the gods of killing would help him. Since then, he had done many good deeds. He built up good karma by killing useless trash in the world. While backing away, Sakamoto asked how Higuchi determined who was useless trash. Higuchi smiled and said they would know by killing them. If they were easy to kill, it meant their karma was weak, and that's what made them trash. Sakamoto replied that the fact that Higuchi hadn't been able to kill any of them meant they weren't trash. Higuchi agreed but said there was a chance they had just survived. Therefore, he said it was important to keep trying, just in case. Irritated, he called Sakamoto stupid and said he was starting to get annoyed. In Sakamoto's mind, he couldn't understand what Higuchi was referring to, but he wondered if it meant he was stupid. The other companions of Sakamoto proceeded directly to safely escort the mother and child to the airport. I was concerned, asking if the man left behind would be okay. A cow replied that he would surely be fine. Konomi then asked if they weren't friends, and if a cow wasn't worried about him. This made a cow ponder the statement about being friends with Sakamoto. Nagumo chimed in while eating, saying that before he joined the assassin department, the two of them were already buddies. A cow agreed with that, but added that they had many friends back then. However, eventually, others disappeared, and only he and Sakamoto remained. This was because others couldn't keep up with them due to their overwhelming strength. Some were even scared of their abilities. So, a cow said that there weren't many people who vibed with them at JCC, making it boring. Konomi thought about it and concluded that it meant the three of them were best friends from before. A cow and Nagumo looked at her. A cow said she wasn't sure about that. But Nagumo just laughed and said a cow didn't need to be bashful, asking if she was embarrassed, to which a cow said that since she sometimes wants to kill Nagumo, she doesn't consider them friends. While they were joking around, Yuzuki remained quiet in front. This prompted Kandaka to ask if there was a problem. Since they left the rest area, Yuzuki had become gloomy. Yuzuki denied this, saying he was fine. Suddenly, something cracked above the tunnel and exploded, just as their car was approaching. They had to break because that part was destroyed and they couldn't pass through. Above, it was revealed that Koba was behind this. He said there were more of them than he expected, which meant Higuchi hadn't done his job properly. Nagumo recognized him as the man who used poison while a cow asked if he thought he could defeat them alone. Meanwhile, Kandaka warned them that it might be a trap. Nagumo quickly got out of the car to attack him, so Koba prepared himself. However, he didn't expect a cow to attack him with a blade. She wounded Koba, but was annoyed that she couldn't finish him off. Koba noticed that a cow moved extremely fast, however he found the situation convenient. Suddenly, a cow started vomiting blood, which shocked her. She wondered if it was poison, even though Koba hadn't even touched her. Nagumo was also affected by the poison, which Kandaka identified as poison gas. Koba praised their perceptiveness. He boasted about his ability to create his own proprietary poison gas blend inside his body. He described it as a poison without smell or color, and most importantly, lethal. He added that poison and enclosed spaces were a perfect combination, calling it a deadly combination. I was worried about their well-being, but Yuzuki stopped them and told them not to move. A cow noticed that Konomi, her mother, and Yuzuki didn't seem affected. Because of this, she concluded that the poison's effects varied among different people. Nagumo said there must be a certain condition for the poison to activate. Kandaka concentrated on figuring out what it could be. He wondered if it was their distance from the enemy, heart rate, or body size. He was worried that if they didn't do something soon, they would be defeated. Koba explained that once hit by his poison, they wouldn't last more than 10 minutes, and for some, even less than that. 
He added that it wasn't messy, was low risk, and once administered, was guaranteed to kill. Therefore, he claimed that poison was the ultimate killing method. From afar, Higuchi and Sakamoto noticed the explosion in the tunnel. Higuchi was sure that by now, Sakamoto's companions were gone, but Sakamoto replied that they weren't that weak. Higuchi added that the tougher the opponent, the more lethal Koba becomes. He said it was especially effective on the woman with them, so he was sure she would be the first to die. Sakamoto became concerned upon hearing this. Higuchi explained that Koba's poison was extremely painful, as if gouging out the guts of those affected. Most people, he said, choose to end their own lives because of it. He was certain the same would happen to Sakamoto's friend. Before Higuchi could even finish speaking, Sakamoto suddenly attacked him with immense force, destroying the weapon attached to Higuchi's arm. Sakamoto said he needed to hurry because of it. The impact of Sakamoto's punch sent Higuchi flying towards the bridge railing. Higuchi couldn't believe what had happened and wondered if it was an explosion. He was puzzled because it was just one blow and noticed that Sakamoto's vibe had suddenly changed. He then wondered if he was already dead. Higuchi broke into a cold sweat, realizing Sakamoto's immense strength and was sure he was going to die. Concerned that he didn't have enough good deeds, Higuchi frantically started picking up litter from the ground to clean up, believing he needed even the tiniest bit of good karma he could get. On the other side, Sakamoto was surprised to see civilians about to cross the bridge, not realizing it was damaged. Worried they might fall into the water, Sakamoto became concerned for their safety. Higuchi noticed this and suddenly clung to Sakamoto's legs, refusing to let him save them because it would increase Sakamoto's good karma. Despite Sakamoto's attempts to shake him off, Higuchi held on tightly. Realizing time was running out, Sakamoto looked around for anything he could use. He noticed a van and some fishing rods on the ground. Suddenly, Sakamoto threw the fishing rods to the other side of the bridge to catch their falling car. Gathering all his strength, Sakamoto pulled them towards him. He then made the car hit Higuchi, finally defeating him. Until the end, Higuchi thought that if he had just one more good karma, this wouldn't have happened. Sakamoto then carried the two civilians out of the car, saving them. And so they thanked him for his help. Sakamoto mentioned that his friends were in trouble and asked if he could ride with them, to which they agreed. Back at the tunnel, Koba reiterated that his poison gas was lethal. He claimed that some people didn't even last 10 minutes, with some succumbing in just one minute. He added that he was the only one with the antidote. A cow wondered why the effect was so quick on them, while Nagumo thought there must be a rule to that poison. Holding a gun, Koba said that even if they figured it out, it wouldn't help them. He suddenly opened fire on them, causing the two to quickly dodge and hide behind a car. However, the effects of the poison were clearly taking their toll on them. Yuzuki approached them along with the mother and child, but a cow couldn't respond anymore. On the other side, Kendaka called out to a cow and Nagumo, saying they needed to hurry, until he suddenly coughed up blood and noticed that the poison has affected him too. Nagumo addressed Koba, asking if he didn't need to keep the mother and child alive. Koba replied that it wasn't a problem. He said the hostages didn't always need to be alive, as long as the rube thought they were. He didn't care if they all died there. A cow glared at him in disgust. Meanwhile, Nagumo was thinking hard because they had all inhaled the poison simultaneously, but only he and a cow were severely affected, not Yuzuki or the mother and child. Although they were fighting, they weren't hit that badly by it. Moreover, Kendaka was quite far away, so it wasn't about their distance. It wasn't about weight, gender, or even clothing. It wasn't about physical fitness either, because they should have been more resistant to the poison than ordinary people. Then, he thought of a possible cause and noticed some rats running at the side, which also seemed affected by the gas. This gave him an idea. Suddenly, a cow stood up and said she would attack Koba, asking Kendaka for backup. However, Nagumo quickly pulled her back, saying no one should move, which surprised Kendaka. He explained that it seemed the more active they were, the faster the poison moved through their bodies. Koba couldn't respond to this statement, while Kendaka and Akao agreed. The poison's effect wasn't as strong when they remained still. Kendaka added that the faster they moved, the quicker the poison spread through their systems. If that was the case, if they didn't want to die, they needed to defeat the enemy without moving. 
Koba just replied, maybe, but deep inside, he was annoyed that they had figured out the answer so quickly. If they had moved for just one more minute, they might have died. He realized they were a hundred times smarter than Aguchi. With that, he suddenly shot at them. Akao said they had no chance in a war of attrition. At the side, Yuzuki was thinking deeply. He realized this might be his chance to kill Kendaka. He remembered his brother's words that if he ruined the plan, someone at the Alkamar orphanage would die. He was conflicted about whether to kill him now, but wondered what would happen after that. It was a now or never decision. His heart then started racing, causing him to suddenly vomit. The mother and child asked if he was okay, but Yuzuki was shocked that he too was affected by the poison. Nagumo wondered how this happened since Yuzuki hadn't moved. Yuzuki couldn't believe it either, so he suddenly knocked out the mother and child with a karate chop to their necks. Everyone was surprised, and a cow asked what he was doing. Yuzuki silenced her and explained that being physically active depended on muscle movement. In other words, their heart rate could also accelerate the poison's effect. He put them to sleep because people's hearts beat slower when asleep. Kandaka asked if this meant they couldn't move or panic. A cow suggested blowing up the enemy, but Nagumo reminded her not to get angry. Koba had already told them that even if they figured it out, it wouldn't help them. And so Nagumo was worried because they would slowly die at this rate. They then checked the car's trunk and asked Kandaka if there were any weapons they could use without moving. A cow was surprised to find a wheelchair and some grenades inside. They thought of a plan, but Nagumo seemed hesitant about it. A cow replied that although it was stupid, she was sure a certain idiot would definitely do it. Nagumo agreed with her point. Koba was surprised to suddenly see a cow in the wheelchair, hunched over. Nagumo removed the grenade pin with his mouth and threw it behind a cow's wheelchair, using a car door as a shield. This caused the wheelchair to move quickly, allowing a cow to reach the tunnel ceiling where she had a chance to get close to the enemy. Koba couldn't believe they used the wheelchair and grenade for propulsion. From the ceiling, a cow attacked with her knife, but Koba blocked it with his gun. He said she couldn't muster power behind her slow attack and commented on her nice try. But a cow suddenly hit him in the stomach, which he didn't expect. She had a gun in her left hand. Koba noticed how a cow relaxed her body and only used the recoil from the gun. It worked, but the exchange of attacks between the two remained intense. Kandaka said that was right. In close combat, a knife was better than a gun. But a cow suddenly threw the knife directly at Koba. He blocked it with his gun, but a cow's bullet hit it, causing the blade to spin and cut Koba's shoulder. A cow said the fight was over. She pointed the gun at Koba's head, but it was out of bullets. Nagumo was ready at the side to shoot their enemy, who nimbly retreated. Nice try, Koba said. He had never seen anyone resist his poison for so long. Nevertheless, he claimed they only had a few minutes left to live. Koba asked a cow what she was feeling. He wondered if she wanted to try ending her life before the poison killed her. However, a cow seemed indifferent and suddenly took out her pack of cigarettes, which Koba didn't expect. She lit a cigarette, and Koba was puzzled why her heart wasn't racing in such a situation. A cow then said, that moron took long enough. Suddenly, a hand emerged from the ground and pulled, destroying the floor where Koba was standing, causing him to fall below. The moron a cow was referring to turned out to be Sakamoto, who had pulled Koba down. Koba thought to himself, wondering where Sakamoto had come from. Sakamoto noticed something strange about the air, and from above, a cow informed him that it was poison gas. As Sakamoto called a cow upstairs, Koba was surprised that a kid had beat Higuchi. Sakamoto remarked that he didn't seem tough, so he wondered why they appeared to be beat up. A cow replied that the poison was making it difficult because it became more effective the more they moved. And the faster they moved, the quicker they would die. However, Sakamoto couldn't understand this. Meanwhile, Koba took out some blades and suddenly threw them at Sakamoto, who quickly dodged them. Nevertheless, he too was affected by the poison. Koba said he was just wasting his energy. As soon as he entered the tunnel, he was infected by the poison. And the faster he ran, the more it would play into his strength. Sakamoto thought that they shouldn't waste any more time figuring things out since a cow's condition was getting worse. Koba stated that assassins are fragile when deprived of speed. So, he claimed he was over. 
But Sakamoto replied that all he needed to do was kill him slowly. This surprised Kendaka, Akao, and Nagumo. Koba charged at him, asking who he think he was. Sakamoto stood still, allowing Koba to stab him in the chest. Akao and Yuzuki were concerned for him. However, Sakamoto grabbed Koba by the neck despite being hit. Sakamoto strangled Koba while Koba repeatedly slashed at his body. Koba wondered what was wrong with this man, as Sakamoto remained poker-faced and calm. Sakamoto's grip on Koba's neck tightened, and Koba was clearly struggling. He could no longer move to attack Sakamoto. Koba then begged Sakamoto to kill him quickly. Akao and the others were shocked by what happened. Soon after, Koba fell on his own and dropped the blades he was holding. Sakamoto looked up and declared that the fight was over. Kendaka suddenly shouted, telling him to hurry and stop his bleeding. He called him an idiot, saying he would die from blood loss before the poison could get him. He then said he had found the antidote. Kendaka injected I, whose child asked if it hurt. The mother and child rushed him, saying he needed the antidote too, but Kendaka replied that he and Yuzuki would go last since they hadn't moved much. Meanwhile, Nagumo searched something on his phone, which turned out to be the JAA bounty site. He discovered that the bounties for Higuchi and Kobayashi were 400 million and 600 million, which surprised them. A cow remarked that Sakamoto must be worth billions now. While sitting on the side with his body wrapped in bandages, Sakamoto said he wouldn't let his name be listed on that bounty site, which made Nagumo laugh. Nagumo was then called for his turn with the antidote and said he was coming. While resting, Akao and Sakamoto talked. Akao commented that what he did while fighting was crazy, asking if he wasn't afraid of dying. He replied that he didn't know how much time they had left, so he just thought of the fastest way to kill the enemy without moving. So in other words, Akao said, he was afraid of them dying. This surprised Sakamoto. From this, Akao figured out that he was the type of person who prioritized others over himself. Akao said she didn't know that about him. Sakamoto pondered her words. Akao added that she hoped he would find more people to care about. Sakamoto asked why, and she replied that it would help them become better fighters. It was for people like the two of them. She then offered Sakamoto a cigarette, who asked how she does that. Meanwhile, Yuzuki, who was sitting next to them, suddenly asked what they would do if they had to weigh the value of someone they cared about against the lives of other people. Akao and Sakamoto were caught off guard by this question. But Akao responded that she would kill anyone necessary without hesitation to protect Akira, even if it meant killing her own heart. Yuzuki pondered this answer when suddenly someone shouted that there was a problem. It was Kendaka, saying that the remaining antidote wasn't enough for both him and Yuzuki. Sakamoto suggested that the poison guy might have more, so Yuzuki stood up and said he'd go look. Akao angrily told him he couldn't, as he was still poisoned and shouldn't move but Yuzuki replied that he was fine. And so Akao then told him not to run. Yuzuki went down to check Koba's body for any remaining antidote and was pleased to find some. Just then, he received a call from his brother Asaki's number. But it seemed a different person was on the other end of the line. A badly beaten man spoke, asking if that butthead was making him do something he didn't want to do. Yuzuki recognized him as Gaku. Asaki said it wasn't nice to call him a butthead, saying he really had no manners. Gaku replied drop dead and spat at him, which angered Asaki, who beat him again. Yuzuki told Gaku not to provoke his brother. Asaki took the phone and said he knew his brother and that he was wasting time. He said it was his job as his brother to motivate his dopey little brother. He told him to call when he had killed Kendaka and not to disappoint him more than he already had, then hung up. This made Yuzuki think. It was clear Kendaka wasn't a bad person because of this mission, but if he didn't do it, his friends at the orphanage would suffer. He remembered what Akao said about killing anyone necessary to protect those she cared about. Yuzuki then mentioned killing oneself. He said he wanted to be strong too. Suddenly, he dropped the antidote he had gotten from Koba, but Kendaka quickly caught it. Yuzuki was shocked by this and thought he's on to him. Yuzuki thought he'd surely get killed, but Kendaka suddenly rushed towards him and handed him the antidote. As Yuzuki caught the bottle, Kendaka suddenly vomited blood and collapsed to the side. Yuzuki broke into a sweat at what had happened. Meanwhile, Akao witnessed the scene from above. Yuzuki remained motionless, 
realizing that Kandaka had chosen to die to protect him. He broke into a sweat as he remembered handing him the antidote. A cow came down to approach Yuzuki. When Yuzuki noticed her, a cow said that she had deliberately dropped that antidote. Suddenly, Yuzuki attacked, brandishing a weapon, but a cow quickly dodged it. Yuzuki told her to stay back while a cow was curious about his weapon. It was a long metallic blade whip that was extremely powerful. Yuzuki's aura had changed now. Fortunately, Nagumo and Sakamoto had arrived. Sakamoto carried Kendaka while Nagumo stood guard in front. Yuzuki suddenly escaped and left, leaving Nagumo wondering what was happening. Sakamoto laid Kendaka down and tried to wake him. He attempted to resuscitate him, but Kendaka remained unresponsive. They asked Takao what had happened, and she explained that she saw Yuzuki deliberately drop the antidote. Kendaka died retrieving it. Nagumo wondered if this meant Yuzuki had killed Kendaka, and for what purpose. A cow told them they didn't know when the tunnel might collapse, so they should take the mother and child and Kendaka outside. When asked about herself, she said she would follow Yuzuki since she was the fastest among them. Nagumo handed her the gun and told her not to let her guard down. As she was leaving, a cow called out to Sakamoto and threw him her packet of cigarettes. She asked him to hold on to them and not smoke them. This was the last time Sakamoto spoke with a cow. Three days after a cow and Yuzuki disappeared, Yatsumura was seen at the hospital. He was standing beside Kendaka's bed, who was admitted there. He was keeping watch when Nagumo and Sakamoto suddenly arrived. The two bowed to him respectfully, with Nagumo carrying flowers. Yatsumura looked at them and acknowledged them as Nagumo and Sakamoto. Since Kendaka wasn't with them anymore, he said he would be the one to thank them for handling the bodyguard mission. Nagumo asked if they hadn't found Yuzuki yet, and he replied they hadn't. Nagumo couldn't believe they would let the person who killed the leader of JAA Special Forces escape. He responded that they had no evidence that Kei Yuzuki actually killed Kendaka. According to the tests, his body was just filled with poison and had no external wounds. Nagumo argued that Yuzuki deliberately dropped the antidote on purpose, as his friend had said but they also didn't know their friend's whereabouts. Yatsumura asked if he expected them to trust that. Nagumo got angry, asking if he was saying that a cow was allied with the enemy. Suddenly, Sakamoto attacked him in anger, but Hyo intercepted him. He told Sakamoto to calm down since they were in a hospital and expressed disbelief at his presence. Nagumo was pleased to see Hyo and asked where he came from. Hyo got annoyed that Nagumo called him bro and added that he was Nagumo's senpai. Kyo asked Yatsumura if he was serious about these guys, which Nagumo and Sakamoto didn't understand. He placed a suit on the bed and said if they followed Yuzuki, they would find their friend. Sakamoto took it as Yatsumura added that if they wanted to find someone, they should do it themselves and gather evidence. Nagumo then asked if he wanted them to join the order and questioned his reason for trusting them. Yatsumura remembered Kendaka's phone call to him earlier. He had said he found promising talent and was sure the three of them would be future leaders of the assassin world. As he turned away, Yatsumura said he didn't trust them. But the assassin world was shorthanded these days, so they would take whoever they could. This surprised Nagumo and Sakamoto, while Hyo couldn't accept it. More than a year after they joined the order, while on a rooftop, Nagumo called Sakamoto and told him he knew where Yuzuki was. A friend from the intel department had contacted him and even provided a map, but Nagumo said that Sakamoto was closest to the location. Because of this, Sakamoto said he would go there immediately. Before hanging up, Nagumo reminded Sakamoto not to kill Yuzuki until they knew where a cow was. Sakamoto quickly left and went to the location they had learned about. Upon arriving at what looked like an abandoned building, someone greeted Sakamoto with long time no see. It was Yuzuki. Shockingly, in front of him was a cow's body, covered with his coat. Sakamoto was stunned by what he saw, and Yuzuki said she was dead. Yuzuki admitted that he had killed a cow. Sakamoto couldn't accept this. A flashback to when a cow was still alive. While smoking, she was talking with her friends and asked what they planned to do after graduation. Since it seemed they had no idea, she suggested they start an assassin business together. She proposed owning 50% while Nagumo and Sakamoto would each have 25%. A cow asked if they had any problem with that, stating that he wasn't CEO material. 
Back to Sakamoto and Yuzuki. The latter repeated that he was the one who killed Ryan Akao. Sakamoto asked why he did it and Yuzuki replied that even if he told him, it wouldn't change anything. Sakamoto listened as Yuzuki recounted how he had been enslaved by JAA this whole time. He said that none of them could ever understand that pain, torment, and loneliness. It was as if he had been submerged in dark water. But now, at last, he was free. Yuzuki said that was all he had to say and asked if Sakamoto was ready for them to kill each other. Sakamoto replied that he had a friend to mourn, so they should finish this. They charged at each other, Sakamoto wielding a blade while Yuzuki used a long sword whip. The intense gaze between the two showed they had been waiting for this moment for a long time. Therefore, neither wasted any time. Sakamoto lunged at Yuzuki, grabbing his clothes, and then he threw him with great force. As he spun, he swung his long weapon to catch Sakamoto by the foot, which surprised him. Once Sakamoto was caught, Yuzuki suddenly pulled his weapon with tremendous force, throwing him against a pillar behind. The impact was so strong that the pillar collapsed. Nevertheless, Sakamoto stood up, unwilling to give in. Yuzuki attacked again, striking with his weapon. However, Sakamoto parried it with his knife while firing a gun in his right hand. And so Yuzuki maneuvered his sword whip to catch the bullets and avoid being hit, then wrapped the metallic blade whip around Sakamoto's body, immobilizing him. When caught, Yuzuki pulled the whip, but instead of injuring Sakamoto, he only managed to pull off Sakamoto's coat as he broke free. Both were in serious mode now. This time, Sakamoto attacked using Yuzuki's weapon, which he had wrapped around his arm. He employed the same move Yuzuki had used against him earlier. While facing away, he coiled the whip around Yuzuki's body and pulled, throwing him upwards. Yuzuki hit the concrete ceiling, which collapsed from the force of the impact. As Yuzuki fell to the ground, Sakamoto prepared for another attack. Yuzuki stood up and ran towards him, but Sakamoto suddenly rushed towards him and slashed through his body using his blade. The force was so great that the blades of the whip detached while Yuzuki bled profusely. Yuzuki could do nothing as Sakamoto knocked him down and stepped on him. Sakamoto pointed a gun at him while he lay there. Looking up, knowing he had no chance left, Yuzuki requested that if possible, Sakamoto not shoot him in the head, as he wanted to watch the sky as he passed away. Sakamoto agreed to this request, while Yuzuki admitted he was tired. Sakamoto simply said yeah, before shooting him to avenge his lost friend. And with that, their battle came to an end. Switching to the present, someone called out to slur his master. It was Kashima, who told him he might catch a cold out there, and so he should go inside. Kashima asked what was wrong, and Slur replied that he had just remembered something embarrassing from the past. This piqued Kashima's curiosity. Slur, resting his chin on his hand, remarked that assassins should think about what their last words would be, because you never know when you're gonna go.